Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, we, we, I, I'm supposed to talk in English now, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but thank you for presenting me in, uh, in uh, Spanish. Uh, anyhow, uh, if you have questions, I can take them in Spanish and French too. Anyhow, uh, I'm here to present what we mean by cognitive semiotics uh, here in Lund particularly, because there is an association of cognitive semiotics which has members worldwide, and uh, but people do understand that, that term a little differently. So what I'm going to present here is the way we understand it in Lund. Uh, okay, I don't seem to be able to share my, my, uh, my uh, presentation. Please uh, sh share screen, it's a green button in the middle. Yes, the I know, uh, but it says one participant can share at the time. Oh, maybe someone is just sharing. Gardi, are you sharing? No, no, no. Let's see if I think multiple, so if it lets me do it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Puedes intentarlo oh. otra vez, por favor? Yeah. Okay. Um, you just have to. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this enigmatic title will be explained later on. Uh, this is uh, more or less official uh, definition of cognitive semiotics. It's the study of meaning making, uh, not only language but also in other semiotic systems or resources, and including also in perception and action. Uh, so what we try, try to do in cognitive semiotics is, is to integrate perspectives, methods, and insights from cognitive science, cognitive linguistics, and semiotics, and placing science and sign use in a broader sense into the wider context of cognitive, social, and neurobiological processes using experimental methods as well as classical text analysis and, and theory. I will explain all these as we go along. So I would like to present semiotics as a, a tradition of research or tradition of thought. Uh, actually, I defined already in a book of mine in 1989 as a series of entangled strands of problem areas, making up a continuous discussion extending through the ages, which can only be grasped a posteriori by taking a retrospective view of some part of this mesh, thus permitting semiotics to be defined and applied to new areas and issues. So just to summarize, uh, it's a series of historical persistent issues of research I have some, uh -huh. and possible solution to these issues, which give rise to other problems uh, for which no problems, new solutions are proposed and so on. So I think this is much more than just uh, purse and or saucer. Uh, I will, I think we can pursue it uh, back into the um, least Greek antiquity. And they have many ideas which I think are still uh, interesting to go back to today. Now, semiotics has in some places become a, 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 a specific discipline. It was, has been that, of course, in many places in Italy, and, and uh, we also managed to do it here in Sweden, but in many other countries, it doesn't exist as a discipline. But, uh, and of course, it for a long time, if this, this fourth tradition I talk about, it didn't exist as a specific discipline. It was often, often parts of philosophy or uh, human and social sciences and even over biology. So uh, if I say it's a fourth tradition, then of course there are many other fourth traditions. So what is the persistent focus of this fourth tradition we call semiotics? Well, the most simple answer is to say that it's meaning. 
Uh, nowadays, we would often say meaning making, sense making, to to emphasize the progressive, the, the dynamic character of it. And uh, in the phenomenological tradition, it was often called intentionality, the fact of being directed to something. Now, this means for Picard's questions like, how does meaning work? Uh, are all meanings signs? Is perception already as such meaningful? Uh, what kind of meanings are there if there are other meanings and signs? How are these meanings different? How do they interact? To what extent can one kind of meaning be translated into another? And there are some questions which have rarely been asked, but there are exceptions to that in semiotics uh, before, but which have become central in this version of semiotics, if you like, which we call cognitive semiotics. And that is how does the use of different kinds of meaning emerge uh, in the development of a child? And also, uh -huh. how does the use of different kinds of meaning emerge in the human species? So how does all this fit into biocultural evolution? Uh, I'm not going to answer any of these questions today, but uh, I have written a lot about, about this and uh, other people also in, in, in cognitive semiotics. Now, I said that semiotics is a large tradition of research. In fact, it's rather notable that um, uh, already in the medieval, in the Middle Ages, uh, the scholastics wrote many uh, books which were called the Treatise of Science. And the second period where, where many semiotic issues were raised was in the Enlightenment. So I think we must count really much more than Saussure or Peirce and what follows them. And uh, it is also, of course, important to say that in the middle of last century, semiotics was finally in some places separate establish a separate discipline. Now, you are maybe more uh, accustomed to this view of, of semiotics, that is as structuralism uh, and with the alternative first. Uh, and I will return to that in a moment. Let's first talk about cognitive science. Well, of course, cognitive science is also a kind of traditional thought, but it has a very different origin than uh, uh, semiotics, because it's, uh, it's a rather recent combination of already established sciences, like, such as linguistics, philosophy, psychology, biology, and computer science. Uh, and the original model was taken from the computer and applied to human beings. So they thought that uh, human beings work more or less like a computer. Most people who are in cognitive science don't believe that anymore. Uh, in some traditions within cognitive has distanced very much from this metaphor, and we have, they have instead been inspired by psychology, they talk about theory of mind and things like that, and they also have been very much influenced by phenomenology in the sense of uh, Edmund Husserl. Now, so you can see we have all these convergences happening in the fourth tradition, cognitive science. And you can mention a lot of people who represent them. Uh, at least one who clearly overlaps with semiotics, uh, Deacon has used uh, Persian terminology to, to discuss uh, issues in neuro neuroscience. Anyhow, uh, So we, in the end, I think that if we ask the same question for, for cognitive science, which we asked for semiotics, I said semiotics is about meaning. And then cognitive science nowadays we, must be said to be about consciousness. Uh, of course, consciousness was uh, in the early history of this uh, cognitive science re reduced to uh, the computer metaphor, but that is, 
more, very rarely the case nowadays. So we, in cognitive science, we are involved with uh, consciousness. Consciousness uh, as a, in a mind which contains a certain thing to think about, which part of the wider domain, a thematic field, and which is also includes the consciousness uh, at the same time of a word, of the time, and of the body and all that. Okay, so the consciousness and meaning is clearly very much related, so that's a good reason already for trying to bring cognitive designs and something else to be on each other. Uh, so what are the gains? For semiotics, if we absorb ideas and, and methods from cognitive science, from a tradition. Well, consciousness, at least in that part of cognitive science, which is uh, now wedded to phenomenology, is seen as intentionality, the fact of being directed to an object. And that also means what we can make use of the phenomenological method. And also we have, of course, the famous 4E, uh, which people in cognitive science talks a lot about. That is the embodiment, the fact that all thinking, all existence is, is related to the body. The body is always part of consciousness, even when you're conscious of something else. And embeddedness, the fact that you're always in a certain situation, in, in a certain uh, landscape, a certain uh, environment, and an activity that meaning is not static, it is something which has to be acted out. And then there is the extended mind, the idea that thinking can be somehow lodged in objects, it can be sedimented into them. So. That is an idea, for example, which was addressed in, in semiotics by Juri Lottmann, but it is quite independently of, of Lottmann, an important uh, part of discussion in contemporary cognitive designs. In fact, all of these issues have been raised beforehand in phenomenology, uh, but not in exactly the same time. So taking account of these, uh, Discussions is, I think, uh, a gain for cognitive uh, semiotics. Now, another thing which will play a, a big role in, in, in cognitive semiotics is the use of experiments. That is, you cr create an artificial situation and you vary something, some properties, and you see what the result is. So, um, now, but before I go on to that, let us say something about phenomenology. Now, phenomenology is a method for studying the way in which things present themselves to uh, consciousness uh, by focusing not on the content of the acts of consciousness, but on the way this content is experienced, presented. And then describe exactly what is experienced without worrying whether the object experience exists or not, only all the experience as such. And then you proceed by a variation of features in imagination, uh, which allow you to see which features have to go together, which can go together and which exclude each other. The result then is that you discover some invariance of experience. You don't look at the particular features of experience, but what is they have in common, what is invariant in them. Now, this of course goes back to Edmund Husserl, the man you see up there. But in fact, uh, Charles Santos Peirce also talked of phenomenology almost in the same terms. Uh, of course, as Peirce always do, he changed the term later on and called it phenoroscopy instead, but the definition is still the same. So why should we need uh, phenomenology in cognitive semiotics? Well, 
we needed to prepare experiments. Uh, it was proposed by Varela and Thompson that you should train people to use phenomenological methods and then you study what happens in their mind. Uh, what seems to me more relevant is what uh, Jean Gallagher has called front-loaded phenomenology. Uh, that is when you allow insights from phenomenology to inform the experimental setup. Uh, but I, would, I think the term would better be phenomenologically loaded experiments. And we have done a few of those, and I will at least I will mention one at the end. So we also need phenomenal after the experiment to make sense of empirical findings and to clarify the concepts which emerge from different traditions. Since we work with both phenomenology uh, and um, when cognitive science, linguistics, and, and semiotics, we have different concepts which sometimes mean the same, with some labels which sometimes present the same uh, concept and vice versa. Uh, and of course, as I said, experimental situation is artificial, so it's a question of how we can relate it to the real world. So what about linguistics in this? Um, Linguistics is, of course, a research tradition which became independent well before semiotics and cognitive science. Uh, and still, it's also part of both semiotics, at least that was, was a sure fault it should be. And in fact, it is a part of cognitive science. Still, I think there is something important in linguistics which had been lost on uh, the classical structuralist semiotics. And that is, uh, that semiotics like linguistics should be a science which studies generalities, typicalities, invariants, or what like you call it. Uh, and uh, I think it's very unfortunate that a lot of semiotics has been concerned with works of art, individual works of art, or even individual uh, advertisements or things like that. But when what we need is really to find out what is characteristic, what is invariant of these kinds of meaning. But it's, we may share that with natural sciences, but it's still different because it's interesting in qualities, that is in categories and meanings, not in quantities. As we shall see, we can use uh, quantities in the form of statistics as an indirect way of attaining the goal of cognitive semiotics. And I think it's, this is the way we need to take uh, linguistic as a model, not as is often done here, uh, uh, using linguistic concept for other kinds of meaning. So the good thing about this analogo is that you um, have to look at general properties of the semiotic uh, resources, not individual works, look for patterns. Uh, and we should avoid uh, projecting linguistic categories to uh, other kinds of meaning. And also it's a pity that so much of, of semiotics has been formalistic and uh, had excluded diachronic uh, uh, dimension and also interdisciplinarity. Now, I would like to characterize this uh, semiotics and also uh, cognitive semiotics as something which works with what I hear called the Vician Prietian super maxim. I call it that because uh, it goes back to the a thinker in the 18th century, Gian Bernista Vico, uh, who pointed out that we understand uh, human, the, the subject of the humanities uh, much better than we can ever understand the natural sciences because what we study in the human sciences are things which we have created ourselves, not as persons, but as human beings. And so we could paraphrase this as we as human beings can understand that which we as human beings have created. Now, uh, it's interesting, before I even knew about 
Vicus Maxine. I had read similar things in the work of the um, Argentinian uh, uh, semiotician Luis Prieto, uh, who suggested in his books, which I think are sorely neglected, uh, that our access to the subject matter of human and social sciences, which he calls the semiotic sciences, is direct. And our access to the natural science can only be indirect. Um, now, this is, of course, a simplification. First, because all sciences, the semiotic sciences included, are engaged in a continuum process trying to approach the truth without ever really arriving there. This was something that was pointed out both by both Husserl and Peirce. And second, the task of explanations carries us beyond what is directly given to the consciousness to, to the layer below, where these can be phenomenologically recuperated or only hypothetical or posit positive. For example, we may uh, have a direct experience of uh, phonemes in the words, to take the linguistic analogy again, uh, as speakers of a language. But normally we don't have the same degree of consciousness or, or features, at least not as they describe at the level of sound. So we still have to go beyond that which we know as human beings. And the other thing is that a lot of knowledge we share the participants in human society, both, uh, both those, uh, our contemporaries and other people who lived before, uh, is what we can, the Ferrolican term can call sedimented, deeply sedimented. That means that meanings which were once produced in direct acts of meaning are now somehow pa passively given. They are also sediments, as Susan says, which form the background of further acts of meaning. And to uh, understand them, we have to reanimate them which is what we're trying to do exactly in phenomenology in the, with the, the, the steps which I explained to you uh, earlier on. So there may be a direct way to the consciousness here, to the theme of thematic field. The thematic field would maybe then here be, be what is sedimented in this case. And um, we can, maybe in some cases reach them by reanimation of these acts. It is what uh, Husserl uh, suggests, and it's, I think, implicit in, in, in Peirce's approach. But there are still some problems with this. There clearly are many instances of knowledge pertaining to human society and history, which are not easily susceptible of being reanimated. Uh, Ludwig Feuerbach had a term for this, which is mostly known nowadays because uh, Marx took it up, reification. That is a lot of, uh, uh, well, Marx gave it the most, most, most narrow meaning, but in Feuerbach it's the idea that uh, things we have created ourselves doesn't appear as our creations. His example is in fact uh, religion. Um, so sometimes our only hope of, of, of um, attaining these meanings is to use the same indirect methods which are developed by the natural sciences. That is, we can't go directly to consciousness, we have to look at some indirect manifestations of consciousness. And this may even be manifestations which are quantitative, as was, exactly as we do in the natural sciences. Now, it, 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 ideally, we should use both procedures to be certain of the interpretation. It's not always possible, but it's a good thing to do. And I will suggest we can do that later on. So this is the three possibilities here now. Okay. Um, in chronic semiotics, we use a lot of different methods. 
I will concentrate here on three of them. But as you see here, I have uh, made a distinction between the phenomena which we try to study and our way of having access to them. This is what makes the difference between introspection and phenomenology. Phenomenology uh, is like, like uh, introspection uh, is you use your own consciousness to, to try to ascertain certain facts. But in introspection, you try to find out something about yourself or you, or you as an individual. In phenomenology, what you try to find out are the invariant structures of consciousness. Now, another way of having access to uh, third person uh, objects is uh, experimentation. And there are many other approaches, but I will here be involved with the phenomenology and experimentation. Uh, so, so I would like to take now an example. Um, Umberto Eco, in his later years, uh, notably in, in uh, the platypus, uh, quantum of platypus, uh, claims that mirrors are not signs. They are not iconic signs because they are not even signs. And now clearly, of course, what he means to say is not that mirrors, but mirror images, because mirrors can't be anything in themselves. Uh, so mirror images, not those correct. This is really what he wants to say, I think. So mirror images are not signs because we are instances of reality itself. And then he adds the television consists of frozen mirrors, mirrors which reflect other mirrors. Now, to decide this, we need a clear definition of what a sign is. Um, and I, I mean the sign as one particular way of conveying meaning, because I think there are other ways of conveying meaning, which we are not going to discuss today but I have written a lot, a lot about them in my papers. Now, I think that we, once we have this clear definition, we can show uh, for phenomenological reasons that Echo's uh, claim is wrong. Um, but I also think that we had made an experiment which also shows that Echo's identification of mirror images with uh, direct perception is mistaken. Now, I don't have time here to enter the discussion of uh, this, what the sign is. I have written about this in many of my papers. Uh, so I was to refer to them. And I will only give you my conclusions here. So a phenomenological definition of a sign says that the sign consists of at least two parts, expression and content. And uh, we can of course subdivide them uh, like first does and also in other ways. And these two parts are relatively independent uh, of that for which they stand, the reference. So these parts are differentiated from the point of view of the subjects involved in the semiotic process even though they may not be so objectively uh, in the common sense life world. For example, indexical sites are clearly not differentiated in, in, in reality. That's the whole point of them, but we can differentiate them and take one, of, one object which is conduced to another as the, the signifier of the other. So uh, this is what you need to have a sign, you have to need this differentiation. And there are also a double asymmetry between the two parts because the expression is more directly experienced than the content. And it's also on the other hand, another asymmetry, uh, the content is more in focus, it's much more important in, in the, it's really the goal, that which we are really directed to in the conscious act. So these are 
properties of signs, I will say. And not all more meanings are with scanned. For example, perceptual meanings are not like this. So, as Eko said, when iconic signs such as pictures are conventional, that is what he said in his earlier writings. But now in Canton Platypus, he says that mirrors are no signs and thus no iconic signs. And a lot of what we think of as pictures, and notably television pictures, are really frozen mirrors. And, but I think that mirror images fulfill all the requirements of being signs, given my definition. Of course, you can say, well, Echo doesn't define it like that. The problem is the Echo doesn't define what the sign is. Now, so let's look at the mirror image. Clearly, expression and content are differentiated from the point of view of a subject. And that in two ways. Uh, the expression does not go continued over into the content in time and space. That is what happens in perception. And that's why people who don't understand mirrors look behind the mirror to, to see uh, where the rest of the person is. No? And expression and content are conceived as being different of different nature. That's why you can't interact with the expression uh, as with another person. Uh, many animals, of course, think that uh, a cat, for example, think that uh, they see another cat and they want to, to aggress it or something like that. But of course, that is when you don't understand uh, the expression content structure of uh, the mirror image. Also, the expression that is the surface uh, is directly experienced. But it's not what is in focus, it's not what is important. It's the content, that which you see in the mirror, which is the important thing, but is indirectly experienced. So I think you can say now that um, there are from logic and reasons to reject uh, Echo's argument, but we can also arrive at that conclusion with the help of an experimental uh, an experimental situation which we uh, realized some years ago. So this is uh, the experimental uh, setup. And you see here, there is three tables, in fact. There is the table in front where a, a child, because we made this experience with uh, two-year-old, we, we two-year-old children, and uh, the child we sit there with the parent behind. And uh, there is a table from which you can see when the hall is open, as it is here, on the other side of the occluder. And there is another table in front. Now, this is how it looks. So we have this space where uh, the child can receive the uh, information. It can be with a hole, so it sees what happens on the other side of the occluder directly, uh, or it can be uh, with simultaneous video. That is, we have a monitor in the hole and the child sees exactly what happens on the other side of the cloud or the other side of the monitor too or we can have pre-recorded uh, video in the monitor. And the fourth uh, condition, we had to make a little different because we had used the mirror. The mirror uh, had to be placed in our position to reflect what happens behind the occluder. Now, Action space is where things happen, and information space is where uh, the information is received. So uh, we had to make a lot of uh, specific uh, things which you had to do to to for. for... Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's about time to get to the conclusions, so maybe maybe you can... Yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm reaching my conclusions, yeah. Yeah, many thanks. Yes, uh, I, I'm not going into all this, but these are things you have to do to, to, for, for, for the uh, experiment to be experimentally valid, statistically valid. 
Uh, so we had 36 children. The problem is I can hear here someone tr making the translation. I hear the, the translator. No, please continue. Yeah, but it's irritating. Anyhow, uh, the test is a comparison of how different uh, two-year-olds benefited from the information conveyed by direct perception, simultaneous conveyed video, pre-recorded video, and mirror images. Uh, we had an obvious choice task, that is we had uh, uh, things which are interesting for the child, which were hidden in the cups. The cups were very different sizes and, and colors, and the combination was systematically varied. So after the hiding, uh, the cups are moved on a tray to another table and the child is invited to make his choice. Uh, something like this, no? So you see it has to be moved. Now, this is of course the mirror condition. Now, if you analyze this, we can show that uh, the mean poor portion, uh, which was correct, for direct perception and simultaneous video uh, are rather close and they are significantly higher than the mean proportion for a pre-recorded video and for the mirror conditions. In fact, pre-recorded video and mirror image was uh, understood at chance level for the, a two year old child. So of course we would have needed to study uh, all older children to see when they start in standing pre-recorded video and mirror images. But one thing is clear, two-year-old children don't understand uh, mirror images, but they do understand direct perception. So the glosses here then is that two-year-old uh, understand, that for two-year-old children, uh, pre-recorded video and mirror image are both too difficult to grasp since it results, the result we had was equal to chance. On the other hand, two-year-old children can understand simultaneously transmitted video as easily as we understand perceived uh, scenes, almost as easily in fact. Whatever you guys conclude then, we, can, we see that mirror image is more comparable at least for a two-year-old child to pre-recorded video than to direct perception and simultaneously conveyed video. Uh, that is how uh, Echo imagines television, but I think it's rather not really the case nowadays. Okay, and... Okay, no, uh, this is... Uh, this is my end, so I try to bring together here, we had in, a uh, certain problem which we studied, a semiotic problem which we studied both using phenomenology uh, and using uh, experimental designs. So that is what we call cognitive semiotics. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Goran. We have a question from Alain. Yes. So Thank you, uh, Goran, for your presentation. Um, actually, I have a question because uh, when you define the cognitive semiotics, you said uh, it's um, the study of meaning, meaning making, but actually, well, uh, the study of meaning making is the definition of semiotics. So uh, can you explain um, what difference you make between semiotics and cog uh, cognitive semiotics? Since for me, what you explain is just semiotics. Okay, uh, meaning making uh, is a term which have been used in semiotics too. I, 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 I listed some number of terms in the beginning. Uh, what I think is specific to cognitive semiotics is that, um, uh, I mean, I can say that I was critical of structural semiotics already in the 80s, uh, because I thought that it was a problem not 
have, having uh, first to, to identify orgasm meaning too much with uh, linguistic meanings, and second, not having recourse to the kind of information which is um, uh, given to us in other, uh, in other sciences. So I was for interdisciplinarity and against uh, the linguistic model already uh, when, I, when I, what I wrote in the 80s. Now, what I didn't do in the 80s was uh, I didn't use my own experimental designs. And that is what we have started doing. So now I didn't have a name for what I was, the kind of semiotics I were doing before, but now I, since other people are interested in doing it, and we call it cognitive semiotics. That's the okay. answer to your question. Yes, absolutely. But uh, you, you know, I, I'm from the Paris school, the Gramscian school. So um, for sure, since the 90s, um, Phenomenal, phenomenology, um, also echoes, uh, works, um, and uh, the, the the body uh, topics are really into that um, into our uh, interests, and uh, that's why I was asking you that because uh, what you mentioned, what you said, which is absolutely excellent and right, uh, we used to call that just semiotics, but not with that cognitive uh, word before. So I was wondering, actually, um, the, the, that reason of, of the, the, this um, cognitive word, but uh, you, you gave a little bit. Yes, of, but uh, if, you, if you read my papers from the 80s, I, I call this se semiotics. Mm -hmm. The only question, I, I didn't realize my own experiments. That is something. I don't know if you do that. Have you done that? I think this is very rare in semiotics. I mean, uh, there was some people in uh, pictorial semiotics, like uh, René Lindekens, uh, for example, who already in the 70s realized experiments and interpreted them in semiotic terms. But apart from that, is, uh, there are very few people have really made their own experiments. And I think that's important because uh, what I did before, I used experimental results from, from psychology and sociology but I couldn't realize them myself. Uh, so I couldn't vary exactly the, the, the parameters which were important from a semiotical point of view. And I think that is what we can do in cognitive semiotics. As you see, we did in this experiment and we had done so in many other experiments. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Many thanks, Corin. Just uh, about to end, I'd like to ask you, based on your on your cognitive semiotics and semantics, and this subjectivity of the participants in semiotic interaction, have you thought about uh, this relationship between what your research and uh, how could it uh, give some lights for for artificial intelligence or, or maybe how can this artificial interaction with subjectivity at some point become more intentional have you think about it uh, in, well in I, I think you you should listen um to um <clears throat> juan mendoza who is going to give a, a lecture uh, later on i think uh, the last time, no? Of the Less yeah. Yes. And he is studying with us in Bund, and he and I, in fact, written some papers together about uh, indirect uh, intentionality, indirect purpose, which is what you find in all kinds of objects, uh, tools and design objects. But also, of course, a computer is uh, something which has an indirect uh, purpose is constructed to realize the purpose, but it has to be constructed by somebody who has a direct uh, purpose. But I, I, I think I, I leave that for him. <laughs> well, many, many thanks, Goran, and many, many thanks to everyone who's here from the eight in the morning or as, as in Europe might be eight 
maybe at night. So it has been a long, long session and it has been delightful for everyone. It's, it's just a taste of what would like to be a great share and great uh, meeting with coffee and drinks and, and to share a lot yeah. with <laughs> many of you. So it's like a pity to have so less time for everyone. And many thanks, Goran, to be here with you. Many thanks. Silvia presenting many many thanks to Neila, to Ina, to Margarita, to Sala, to Andres, to Jamila, and many of you that has been in the in the YouTube and the Facebook uh, broadcast. So let's let's uh, get together again the next Saturday and the three Saturday that that it's about to come. Many thanks okay. for thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Many thanks, Goran. Many yeah. thanks. Bye.